So thank you very much for organizing and thank you for having me. I'm a PhD candidate at Stockholm School of Economics, but I'm not in Stockholm at the moment, I'm in Chicago, so I could only join over Zoom, but I'm very happy to be here. So I'm presenting this work, with, which is joint work with Stefano Tripodi at CBS, and it's about unemployment and intra-household dynamics, the effect of male job loss on intimate partner violence in Uganda. So, um, as we all uh, no households are very vulnerable to economic shocks, especially in low income countries. And these economic shocks, especially when negative, may affect intra household dynamics and intimate partner violence. And uh, in this paper, we define intimate partner violence as any violence perpetrated by the husbands uh, with respect to their wives. Um, as Denise already mentioned very nicely, um, unfortunately, the problem of intimate partner violence is very widespread. It affects, uh, in 2019, it affected more than 240 million girls and women, and low-income countries are uh, particularly vulnerable because of um, uh, the low resources and because of the prevailing gender norms. And uh, intimate partner violence can have very negative impact on women's health and labor market outcomes, um, and also on children outcomes, as it has been shown that children of women who were victims of violence during pregnancy have lower uh, birth weight and are more likely to die uh, very soon. So in this paper, uh, I think it's nice that it follows Denise's paper because it's a bit uh, a complement. Um, we look at the effect of husband's job uh, disruption on the incident of on, on the incidence of intimate partner violence among female food vendors in Uganda, and we do so uh, using a sample of urban and working women. They are all female food vendors, uh, and one could imagine that being uh, on average more economically empowered than the average Uganda woman, uh, they could be completely insured against the consequences of a negative economic shock. We um, collect uh, our own data through a form survey uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in November 2020. And uh, for our identification, we uh, take advantage of the COVID-19 containment measures that the government of Uganda imposed. Um, and uh, in the created exogenous variations uh, in the uh, employment status of the husband, uh, while we keep the employment status of the women, our respondents, constant because they are all female food vendors, and as such, they were all allowed to keep working during the lockdown. I will describe the identification better uh, in a moment. Uh, what we find is that physical violence, uh, which include in our paper, uh, includes both beating, such as slapping or punching, and also sexual abuse, increases by five percentage points in the, um, as a consequence uh, uh, of job loss. And these represent an increase of 45% uh, for the affected group of women whose husbands lost a job uh, compared to the non-affected women. And we see that this effect is immediate after the economic shock is realized, but is temporary. So a few months later, uh, after the economic shock is absorbed, we see that violence seems to subside. So uh, again, Denise anticipated me very well on this. There is a bit of literature on uh, the link between intimate partner violence and economic conditions. There are a bunch of papers looking at the impact of aggregate level shocks. Some of them use the Bartic style, Bartic, Bartic, sorry, style instruments uh, to um, instrument for the change in employment status of either of the partner. There is literature on the impact of cash transfers, either RCTs or evaluating governance programs. And then there are a few natural experiments. One uh, is Denise's one, and another notable one is by Sonia Balotra in Brazil, when she sees that unemployment, uh, both of the husband and of the wife, increases intimate partner violence, and actually unemployment insurance doesn't help. In this paper, we look at the impact of an individual uh, negative economic shock, in particular to the husband's employment, 
on IPV, and we exploit a natural experiment. And we have an inter interesting sample of urban and relatively economically empowered women. And we also contribute to the rich literature on the um, on IPV during COVID times, which is, uh, especially in developing countries, sometimes uh, lacks identification. So a bit about the context, um, IPV is widely accepted in Uganda. And according to the DHS data from 2016, women, 40% uh, of women say, for instance, that their husband is justifying beating them if they neglect the children. And um, about 50% of uh, women aged between 15 and 49 experienced at least an act of intimate partner violence in their lifetime. And um, in 2020, uh, an increase in the cases reported to the police was registered. So they were reported about 70,600 cases as opposed to the 13,600 reported in 2019. And of course, this doesn't, this doesn't imply any causal. But it suggests that in 2020, uh, something uh, was happening and it was reported in the news very widely. These are two quotes from a national newspaper um, in Uganda, where they signaled that intimate partner violence increased uh, quite substantially in um, 2020, and of course we can think it, we can think of this as just the tip of the iceberg because most of the cases of uh, intimate partner violence don't get reported to the police, as the police has limited scope uh, in what they can do, and sometimes they try to reconcile the couple, so it's not always what the women uh, want. Um, as I mentioned, for our identification, we exploit. Uh, the reaction of the Ugandan government to the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, in March 2020, there were very few cases of COVID-19 registered in the country, but the president, uh, Museveni, reacted very strongly uh, to the threat of the pandemic and starting from March, he imposed very strict measures uh, in the country to contain the spread of the disease. So starting from, you can see the timeline here, maybe it's easier to follow. Starting from mid-March, he decided to close the school and suspend all political rallies, religious gatherings or social activities. Then he closed the borders, he um, suspended public and also private transport. And um, also he stopped the activity of markets apart from food markets. And uh, in addition, he also decided to suspend the activity of all those businesses considered non-essential. So non-essential businesses would be all the businesses that are not uh, essential for the um, life of the citizens. So for instance, uh, tailoring shops, uh, factories, um, uh, construction work and so on. While the essential businesses such as uh, food uh, markets and uh, food vendors, uh, doctors, pharmacies, activities of the uh, revenue authorities and so on, were allowed to continue operate during the lockdown. In, uh, in the paper, we define the, the period of March, so before April, uh, the pre-lockdown period. Then during April and May, um, these measures that I've just listed were in place and also a strict curfew was in place. And so we call this period the lockdown period where effectively there was a lockdown. And then this lockdown uh, started to be released. So the measures started to be relaxed slowly uh, at the beginning of June. Uh, and we uh, consider August and September as the post lockdown period where most of the measures were not in place anymore. And uh, we started the, uh, our activities at that point. We started with a market screening and a listing survey. And then we um, conduct our main data collection activity in November 2020. So the delay you see is mainly due to the time needed for ethical and government approvals. And um, about this, one additional aspect I should mention is that 
uh, all our respondents are female food vendors, so they were allowed to operate during the lockdown period, but the president asked them to sleep at the market, so they would go to the market and stay there also during the night to avoid commuting and uh, uh, potentially spreading the disease. And this is um, quite important because it could be a reason why they did, some of them decided not to work eventually. So what did we do? Uh, the first thing we did was contacting about 53 market chairpersons in Kampala, Mukono, and Wakiza districts in Uganda. These are quite, uh, these are pre-urban and urban areas of the country. Kampala is the capital city. And um, 35 of these chairpersons uh, were happy to collaborate with us. So these chairpersons are basically the leaders of the market. They are in charge of providing security, organizing the, the market stalls, uh, receiving complaints, and so on. And so uh, with this we asked these 35 market chairpersons to provide us with a list of all female food vendors operating in their markets. We compiled this list of about 3,000 women, and we reached out to them to ask some eligibility questions, um, which you see listed here. So the, we asked them whether they were actually selling food and food-related items. So we wanted to be sure that they were um, allowed to work during the lockdown. They had to be older than 18. They had to be married or cohabiting uh, with a man before the lockdown. So uh, in, I generally talk about uh, husbands and wife, but we also consider cohabiting couples. And sometimes marriage is uh, not, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not well defined. They have to to have they have to have worked during the lockdown. So they, they, all of them, uh, all of food vendors could work, but uh, some of them could have decided not to work. And so we also. We only want um, to include in our sample those that actually worked. And they had to mm, be the sole users of a mobile phone. And this is mainly for security reasons because we ask um, domestic intimate partner violence questions by phone and we wanted to ensure as much as uh, possible that they were safe. So out of these 3000 women we contacted, 950 met this criteria. And uh, the non-eligible women uh, were non-eligible mainly because they were not married or not cohabiting with a man, or they decided not to work during the, the lockdown because uh, the business was low in general in the country, or because um, they couldn't commute to work or they couldn't sleep at the market. Um, then in November 2020, we uh, called back these 950 women. We only reached 809 of them mainly because the lions were not active anymore, or some of the women were not interested in participating in the survey anymore. And we conducted our survey, mainly we asked some questions about um, uh, husbands, uh, their own uh, employment, their husband's employment, some individual characteristics. And then the core of the survey was about um, intimate partner violence. We asked about um, intimate partner violence specific episodes, such as uh, um, slapping, punching, pulling hair. And these questions are taken from the DHS domestic violence module. And they were asked in reference to the lockdown period. So we would ask, has your husband uh, slapped you during April or May 2020? We also asked about the period before the lockdown and after the lockdown, but unfortunately we could do so just in an aggregate form. So we only ask about as your husband um, uh, committed physical, uh, into physical violence to you before the lockdown. And this was because we needed to keep the, sh the survey as short as possible since we were um, uh, conducting it by phone. We also tried to validate our measure uh, of violence using a list experiment technique. I won't be talking about this today, but I'm happy to, to discuss it later on. And it's, it's important for me to, 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 to convey that we try as much as possible to ensure their women's safe, safety and confidentiality. So we only employ um, female enumerators to conduct the survey. And uh, we call the women uh, during working hours where they were uh, at the market to uh, ensure that they, as much as possible that 
asked their family members weren't around. And we asked all the questions in a way that they could be answered uh, with a yes or a no, so that uh, the people around could not, um, could not understand the topic of the conversation. The main outcomes uh, we examine in, in this paper are three indicators for any violence during the lockdown, any physical violence, which as I said before, includes both beating and sexual abuse, and any emotional violence, which is um, mainly having been insulted or uh, made felt uh, worthless and useless. So um, a bit more now that I, I've described the, the whole procedure, maybe it's a bit easier to understand the identification. So as I mentioned, non-essential occupations were not allowed to operate during the lockdown period, and this creates some variation in the husband's employment status. So some husbands continued working while some others uh, couldn't work. While all respondents are food vendors and they reported to have worked during the lockdown. So there is no variation in their employment status. So what we do is in, in this paper is basically comparing two groups of women, which we call non-affected women whose husbands were allowed to work during or farmers uh, or doctors to affected women whose husbands were unemployed during the lockdown. For instance, uh, motorcycle drivers, construction workers, and so on. And for this identification to be valid, uh, we need three um, assumptions. The first one is there is no anticipation. So the restrictions were unexpected and were announced um, uh, by the president through the social media, the radio and the TV, and they were effective immediately. So there was, there was little time to adjust. Um, then the second uh, concern one might have is that we only include in our sample women who decided to work during the lockdown. That is an endogenous decision for sure. Um, but since we collected listing data, we can check that the decision to work or not during the lockdown is um, not correlated to the employment, to the husband's employment status. So there is no differential selection into our sample in the two groups. And finally, the husband's selection into an essential or non-essential activity um, must be exogenous with respect to intimate partner violence. And we can check this by looking at the um, intimate partner violence reported before the lockdown, and we see no difference. Um, so what we do is we ask the respondents about their husband's occupation and according to, to what they report, we categorize them as non-affected and affected. And in this graph, I'm plotting the distribution of a husband's um, occupations. Um, and um, in yellow, you can see the husbands of the non-affected women and in green, the husbands of the affected women. So, the husbands of the non-affected women are mainly food vendors and farmers, and they could work uh, during the lockdown. And the husbands of the affected women, are, there is much more variation for them. They are uh, manual workers, non-food vendors, boda boda, which is motorcycle drivers, uh, employees, and so on. Um, and so we categorize the women according to the husband's occupation, and we compare these groups of women. Uh, as this is not an RCT, we didn't expect and we didn't expect and we didn't achieve perfect balance across the two groups. But I just wanted to show you uh, uh, some balance checks with respect to violence, uh, physical and emotional before the lockdown. This is self-reported by the women, uh, and we don't see any difference across groups. And this is. Um, uh, this is supporting that our identification is valid, hopefully. And uh, um, while we, we have some imbalance in other characteristics like uh, husband's education, uh, uh, woman's income and others, uh, other, other, other few, and we control for that, for those in all our specifications. So the empirical strategy is quite straight straightforward, we regress our uh, outcome variables, which are indicators of uh, um, violence uh, during the lockdown on a dummy um, 
for the woman being the affected group. So uh, is being married with a man who lost the job during the lockdown. We control for some wife and husband's characteristics like education. We control for the reported incidence of violence before the lockdown. And we include age and uh, market fixed effect. And we cluster our standard errors at the market level, which is the sampling unit we used. And so what we are after is this coefficient beta one uh, is our parameter of interest, which is uh, effectively an ITT. Uh, we are estimating because as much as the measures were implemented and uh, effective immediately, there, there was some non-compliance. So we also run a um, two-stage D-square specification and the results are of course in line with the OLS and they are just a rescaling of the, of the OLS for the compiler, so I'm not showing them um, today. Uh, so the first piece of evidence, um, yes. You have five minutes left now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, the first piece of evidence is that um, the, the reported violence during the lockdown, 12% uh, of women reported physical violence and about 42% reported emotional violence. And uh, almost the same, um, the, the percentage of any violence is almost the same, which suggests that almost all women who reported physical violence also reported emotional violence. And this is, seems to suggest that the two types of violence are not substitutes, but are indeed complement. Then jumping right into the results, which are summarized only in this, in this slide. Um, so in the left-hand side of the slide, uh, I'm um, plotting the coefficients uh, for um, the parameter of interest which is the effect of male job loss on the, uh, three types of violence, physical, emotional, and any violence. The um, red uh, dot is with only the main controls and the blue dot is in blue square actually, including uh, other controls to hopefully increase precision, but didn't help that much. And uh, you can see that um, for physical violence, we uh, find that uh, male job loss increases physical violence by five percentage points, as co um, and this is an increase of 45% over the uh, non-affected group mean, while we don't see any effect for emotional or any violence. And um, we move to the post-lockdown period, we uh, implement the same, um, the same analysis, and we don't see any, the coefficients are much smaller and not significant, so this seems to suggest that the impact of uh, male unemployment on intimate partner violence was immediate, um, but also short term as during the post lockdown, we don't see uh, any effect anymore. Finally, uh, we provide some robust checks and some uh, uh, heterogeneity, but this is the most interesting according to us. We expected the women who were already victims of violence to be more affected by the husband's unemployment, but we actually see the opposite. So if we focus in the, on the first uh, column about physical violence, uh, we interact our main dummy of interest with um, the indicator of physical violence in the pre-lockdown period, and we see that this interaction is uh, actually negative and not significant. And it seems that all the increase in violence is uh, up happens uh, to those women who were not victims of violence before the lockdown. So it seems it's new violence. Um, okay, I will go quickly on this because um, we don't, we are not um, in the position of exploring the mechanism very rigorously. So we can only suggest some of this mechanism and we uh, suggest that uh, the results are driven by an economic channel because the effect is short term and because we see a bigger decrease in the husband's contribution to the household expenses for the women in the affected group. And uh, we have suggestive evidence ruling out the exposure theory because we don't see any difference in the nights women spent uh, in the market. Uh, that could be a um, coping mechanism for women if exposure was the, um, the main issue. And the stress theory, um, because we ask about husband's uh, alcohol consumption during the lockdown and we don't see any difference across the two groups. Um, 
Yes, I think I'm out of time. So I will just conclude saying that in this paper, we examine the causal effect of male job loss on intimate partner violence, and we exploit the COVID-19 measures as a national experiment. And we see that uh, male unemployment uh, increases intimate partner violence likelihood by five percentage points. And the effect is short term and is uh, concentrated on those women who were not victims of violence before the lockdown or before the unemployment shock. And we think this is quite important because in Uganda, like many other developing country, about um, a, a huge amount of the workforce is engaged in informal labor uh, with very low job, uh, job protection. And so unemployment can happen um, often. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't examine uh, channels very rigorous, rigorously, so we cannot provide the specific policy recommendation, but it seems that women married to um, unemployed partners are particularly vulnerable, and so uh, we should devote more attention to them and try to reintegrate their husbands into the labor market. And that's it. Thank you so much, and feel free to get in touch for um, questions or comments after this. Thank you.